you were there last year. Oh, yes, to the expo. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, welcome everyone to our Tuesday night chat. It's so ex excited, uh, so good to be with you all tonight. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers, and uh, I'm just going to introduce you to them all, to them to you all. Um, so, if you're joining us for the very first time, my name is Kelly Wilkins from My Self Reliance, and this is where we get together on a Tuesday. Uh, to talk to amazing Australians who are in this space of self-reliance, helping us to uh, get our freedoms, get back to basics um, with our finances, our relationships, our food storage, um, all those good things. And we are really only two weeks away. We're getting very excited for our annual expo coming up. This year it's in Kenthurst. And it's on a beautiful property, uh, a privately owned property. If you haven't been to the festival last year, then you want to get along to the expo this year. It's a free family event. You can get your tickets uh, at myselfreliance.com.au and check out the schedule, the lineup of speakers there. Um, you'll find that we've got so much to see and do. Uh, and workshops, which you will absolutely love. So plan your day. It starts at 9. It goes right through till 4.30 uh, with something happening every hour, including an art auction. So you might have a little creative streak um, and, and paint away. You can bring your artwork along on the day. helps if you register it online first. Let us know so we can prepare. Bring your artwork. 10 will get chosen to be auctioned off. So you'll be able to, to vote for your favourites. Uh, and if yours gets uh, voted, the top 10 will be able to be auctioned off. We've got an amazing auctioneer coming in just for our art auction. And the creator of, uh, of those auctions will be able to earn 10% of the proceeds. So... Yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of fun stuff happening, pony rides, uh, all the good stuff. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Zach. Welcome, Zach, Hello. from Power of the Pulse. Good to have you here. Let me just pin you so I can get you on there as well. Otherwise, we won't be able to see you. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Hey, pleasure. And this is uh, the second interview that we're doing with Zach. We have had him on last year as well. And yep. we're so glad yeah. to have Zach back to give us the update on all things nanotechnology. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm very excited. You know, in the past months we've we've increased our outreach. You know, uh, we've we've furthered uh this the scope of the mission, um, and we've also delved deep. You know, into new topics. Uh, we've we've now gone into you know uh, more talking about electricity. Uh, we've uncovered more about uh, biotechnology, as as you put in the you know very good description uh, for the the telegram and the email that you sent out, and and also some very concerning and uh, new things that we've uncovered, uh, both myself and the the group that I that I work with worldwide. Uh, so I'm very very excited to be to be back on here. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, I just like to say, you know, I I was very very pleasantly surprised. Uh, you know, the response that we had to to last. Uh, presentation, I posted it, you know, on my own channels, and particularly the, you know, the Australian people that we that we helped a little bit more, maybe provided some new perspectives and aspects, and you know, for a few months, my my emails just got lit up with with tons of people asking questions and inquiring, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity uh, to to further, you know, our our outreach and and hopefully educate and help people more. Right. Well. Before we jump into learning more about that uh, with you, Zach, I'm going to introduce Jeff. And Jeff is our accountant. Uh, and Jeff's going to talk more about uh, taxation. So, and give us the world of what that looks like. And then we're going to, got a big lineup tonight. We've got Michael Smagan here, who is a financial planner. And Michael's going to, 
wrap up the evening sharing with us all the important information about our finances. Let me just find you, Michael, so I can add you as well. There we are. Hi, Michael. Good evening, Kelly. How are you? Excited Very to be here good. as well. <laughs> So we are going to just start off with a chat with Zach tonight uh, and find out more about this and then we'll jump over to Jeff and we'll finish up, as I said, with Michael. So, so Zach, first of all, for those who don't know, uh, what is nanotechnology? Let's start with that. Okay. Okay, this is, you know, when we talk, firstly, I just want to put a disclaimer here, when we talk about these topics, and this is a range of topics, and the reason it is, is because you can start by looking into what nanotechnology is, but soon you will branch out into all aspects of really uh, what you could call an assault or a takeover against us. And that might seem, you know, very conspiracy theorist at first, but uh, then you start looking at the papers, the the research, and it's it's very real. But I just want to make this point that when we talk about nanotechnology, we're really talking about a very multidisciplinary, uh, multi, you know, interdimensional technology that can be applied everywhere in everything, literally. But the, the term nanotechnology refers to uh, the, the synthesis of, uh, okay, let's, sim let's simplify that a bit, creating and manipulating particles on the nanoscale. So nano means a billion. So when we talk about, you know, a meter, a centimeter, a millimeter, a micrometer, then you have a nanometer. So a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Uh, the nanoscale is generally defined as between one and 500 nanometers. So anything, any nanoparticle or nanotechnology is simply talking about something, an element or a chemical or something that is in that size range of one to 500 nanometers. Now, just to put in perspective for people, uh, the, I heard about nanotechnology years and years ago uh, in my background in skincare, and it started to be used, this nanotechnology in skincare. And what they found is that at first they thought it was an amazing thing to have this nanotechnology, but what they discovered is that um, particles could break the blood-brain barrier. And you don't want your skincare to to um, pass through into your brain. That's not where skincare is meant to be. So so this is where um, this technology can be very dangerous if used in the wrong way. So just a little bit of perspective on that. And we'll try not to get too technical, Zach, otherwise we might just... Well you you've no. focused, you've directed me in the direction of you know future concerns so yeah. quite specifically i've focused on uh, uh preparing some information regarding what are we actually looking at for the future what are the concerns and i'd like to tie in a lot of a different uh a different concerns that a lot of people have raised uh, in our wider communities i'm sure a lot of you have heard about social credit systems smart cities digital id cbdc's we have the i mean the 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 financial planners and the accountants here would know a whole lot more about uh, me on those topics but when you connect all of those with a a biological and computational control over people and that ability then it's it's quite quite scary where we're going so focusing on that that fu those future perspectives i won't i won't get too technical but what i'm calling the post pandemic problems are you know we've i think a lot of us would agree that you know we've probably put that that fiasco behind us for now and you know we think we think we've moved on but really i believe that I believe that a lot of resources were invested into this presentation, into this, uh, into this situation, and I think that that can be connected into a wider, uh, a wider understanding of what was this for? Why did they spend trillions of dollars? Uh, actually, you know, let me let me actually open up my notes. Um, on this so you know trillions trillions of dollars were spent 
on maintaining the media presence, on the, the medications, both administering the test kits, administering the advanced therapies, the advanced therapeutics, this thing, uh, if, if you've watched the, the previous presentation, we will refer to that as the carrot, the thing that, that comes over here and you, you do this, this thing and then come over here, that's a carrot. Um, and let's talk about censorship, right? How much money has been in invested in censorship? So this is all possibly leading up to something bigger. And so I'll give you, I'll present you this number, 70 million, 700,000, 70 million, 700,000. What is that? Is that the people that, that died from uh, the cough cough? No. 70 million 700,000 is the number of COVID carrots that have been administered in Australia. Oh. 70 million 700,000. So that is, according to my calculations, if the population of Australia is around two, uh, 26 million people, that is 2.7 carrots per person. We're putting the rabbits out of business. And since 2023, so just 2023, to April 2024, 5.9 million boosters have been administered globally. 5.9 million. So this also, I think, is a bit of an indication that the psychological operation has, has not ceased at all. And people are still going and taking the fourth and the fifth and, and being good citizens. And I get it. Okay. So trillions of dollars were pumped into that fiasco to maintain the media facade, to have everyone panicking, to administer the tests, and to administer technical, technologically advanced therapeutics. And I believe this was done for a reason. And since then, the health issues that people have suffered and will continue to suffer because of these carrots and because of what's in them is really, really concerning. People are getting sick with things that doctors have never seen before. And this may not be in the public consciousness unless you yourself are suffering from an, an illness that the doctor can't, can't even diagnose or diagnoses and it's just this weird thing. There's no cure. We don't know what causes it. It's just, it's a genetic anomaly. That's it. We can't do anything for you. Suffer for the rest of your life. More gallons, Lyme, fibromyalgia, uh, what, whatever it is, whatever name they come up for it. And... You know, as someone who's now been in this for a while, you would be very shocked as as to realize just how many people are are suffering this. And personally, you know, just through uh, my my friends and my friends of my friends, I know many people that that have suffered horrific side effects that the medical community won't even uh, recognize. And so, people are getting sick with illnesses that there is no cure for. There is no cure. And what's even worse is that people that haven't eaten carrots, not even a single carrot, they are also suffering badly. And as I mentioned in my first talk, you know, there are many uh, aspects to this and I, I will never stand or sit here in front of you and tell you that this is only about nanotechnology. This is only about a carrot. This is only about transhumanism, far from it. You know, and we have many, Many people that know a lot about the, the allopathic solutions to a lot of our regular problems. Parasites, uh, candida, uh, heavy metal toxicity. But this is a, an aspect that is very potent that really nobody's talking about. And, you know, that's, that's my mission, I think, is to, is to help educate and really get the word, the word out there and then really talk about solutions. Because a lot of people will just, you know, it can be very overwhelming and I understand that and we'll turn a blind blind eye and just turn away from it and you know out of sight out of mind but I think when we actually face what is going on we can actually find a lot of solutions and a lot of hope that we can rise above the spirit of fear and actually take uh take positive action affirmative action to help ourselves and our loved ones so I think that, you know, that's what you can expect uh, in the expo, talking about the problem, really delving into the specifics, but also having a real focus on the solution, the scientific solution, 
you know, I, I invite anyone to challenge me on any of the claims I make, uh, please go ahead, you know, um, and, and I'd love to, to have a discussion. So the scientific solution on based on our understanding of the problem and what we can do and then some hands-on uh some hands-on actual you you can you know look at the anti-nano devices that we present you can try them uh, etc but the let, post -pandemic... Let, me just, uh, let me just interrupt you there for a second zach and um it's very interesting what the point that you bring up uh because a lot of people are not focused on what we're talking about now for anyone who's really not clear, uh, the reason that we use this word carrot is that Zoom picks up on the words that we say. We know the technology that we have is such that such that we do need to be uh, um, careful so that we, the, you know, the censorship laws, um, we don't want to be wiped off. We just want to talk about what's, what's happening. So we're using this word. But I want people in the audience to if you can relate to what Zach's saying, and if you know somebody who has experiencing some level of health concern that the doctors uh, cannot diagnose or they're passing off as of something that and, and is related to this, type a yes in the chat. Let's see how many people can, yeah. Oh, right away, right away, wow. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's when you when you start coming to the realization that that we're dealing with something that generally just does not act or function in the the normal way of things. And I know I'm being very vague, but let let's move on to mm -hmm. the uh, post pandemic problems, if if that's all right with you, Kelly. So yes. since since Kelly has told me that this is you know more focused on the future future concerns, I'm going to talk about. The World Economic Forum. So, who who here is just to to gauge some some aware uh, to, to gauge the awareness of the the group who who's heard about the World Economic Forum? Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. In fact, the Beautiful. question is Beautiful. who hasn't? <laughs> who ha right. <laughs> good, good. So, I checked I checked the website today. I have a few of Klaus Schwab's books. I'd I'd recommend reading the Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab, uh, written in 2015 or 2016. And he brags that now uh, all of his predictions, like uh, I think nine out of 15 predictions have come to pass. And uh, as a side note, one of the predictions is that nanotechnology uh, will be, will revolutionize the field of warfare mm -hmm. and, uh, and fighting and uh, assassinations. Uh, I, I add that personally, uh, just based on my understanding of this technology. But, on the website, it says the World Economic Forum shapes global, regional and industry agendas, global, regional and industry agendas. So basically, to me, let's just let's just all agree that they're basically manipulating the whole world for whatever they want. So, OK, who here has heard of Yuval Harari? He works at the World Economic Forum. He's an advisor. Yep, yep. Humans are hackable animals. Yep, yep. So let's let's look at some of his quotes. And I've I've actually on my podcast, I've done a full breakdown and people people love that. I've done a full breakdown, you know, 20 minutes of just all of Yuval Harari quotes and actually talking specifically about, you know, the scientific uh, background and, and backing for that, because this man is really not speaking, you know, just from his head. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that he says that that is very, very scientific here. So what are we talking about? Humans are now hackable animals. Governments and corporations will have the ability to hack all the people. Governments and corporations will be able to will have the ability to hack all the people. Biological knowledge. This is his equation. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with B times C times D equals A H H, which is biological knowledge times computing power times data equals the ability to hack humans. Hmm. Humans will be merged with technology. There was recently a clip of him saying, you know, we are the last a generation, you know, of an era. And now, you know, we will be merged with the technology and we will be controlled by AI and blah, 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 blah. There's also one that's, you, you may not be as familiar with that's also very concerning. He says, we will know you better than you know yourself. Mm. We will know you better than you know yourself. 
Klaus Schwab famously said that the fourth industrial revolution, which is, you know, what the era we're in now, according to him, what we're experiencing, the fourth industrial revolution won't change what you are doing. It will change you. And as an example, he talked about taking a gene editing pill, how that won't change necessarily your day to day. Although that that may be an aspect, but it changes you. Who here has heard about eugenics or eugenicists? Beautiful, beautiful, very, very aware group. Okay, so generally here we're talking about reducing the population. Now, some people will tell you, you know, uh, that they are talking about, ooh, five minutes left. Okay, I better fast track this. They're talking here about reducing the population to 200 million people. So, you know, off with the, the 8 billion, we're down to 200 million people. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if anyone will do that uh, as, as part of an intentional plan. I don't know if something like that will happen. What I can tell you, though, is that there is a very strong agenda that I believe is coming regarding controlling large populations. So we may still have a, a great population, but if you listen to people like our friend uh, Gil Bates, I think you know what I'm talking about, Gil Bates, the, the nice guy, the philanthropist, <laughs> he's, all, <laughs> he's all about things like cancer-causing medication and birth control and carrots and all of these things and, you know, giving access, worldwide access. He's a very kind man and he gives from the heart all of these very, very toxic things that kill people. Whoops. And when you, when you start listening to these people more and more and you look at the science, there's a very clear agenda with controlling populations. What are we, what are we talking about specifically here? Well... When you think about the, the kind of the hot topics currently, social credit systems, uh, has everyone seen, you know, what's been happening with China in, in the social credit system, how every single aspect of these people's lives is digitally controlled. And if they're bad citizens, if they're bad people, then whoops, you know, you can't get insurance. You can't get, you can't go to university. You can't get public transport. You, you're a bad person. You know, you, you ate too much chocolate. Chocolate is bad for the environment. It has it requires too much water. You're contributing to the climate crisis. Of course, this is not China, but let's extrapolate a little bit. And you can't get a job. Now you're a bad person. You go to the asylum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we've seen how how absolutely abused the dissidents are. So social credit system, central bank digital currencies, digital IDs, and smart 15-minute cities. These are not separate concepts. These are all, how much, how much time do I have left, Kelly? These are all one system that will be put together with a fifth component, a fifth component that not many people are talking about. You see, the technology inside of the injectable a lot of people actually don't know this. The technology inside of the injectable has actually tagged people. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm the first person to go, no, that's not verified. Uh, show me the proof. Show me the evidence. But the thing is, I have seen the evidence. And people worldwide have proved this over and over and over and over again. Maybe not with every single injected person, but with a large amount of people that took these injectables, they are emitting Bluetooth addresses. They're emitting network communicable addresses. So when you think about this and you think about the research with intrabody nano networks, wireless body area networks, the internet of bodies, where we theoretically connect people to the internet, where we monitor their biology and control their biology with nanoscale or nanoscale component devices, a device that is so small, it can swim in your bloodstream, a device that is so small, we can just target it and tell it to go to your liver and stay there and then give us information about your liver, perform uh, you know, biological uh, monitoring, monitor biomarkers, monitor your microbiome, so the, you know, the microbial activity in your body, let's say in your stomach, uh, monitor different aspects of your health 
And we can also then administer drugs, have drug delivery inside of you. We can have uh, lipids or nano cages inside of you that are released upon a certain command. So we, we treat them with heat, we hit them with a certain radio frequency, and now something inside of you has been released and you are now being medicated with a sedative because you broke, uh, you broke the law. Now, we can combine that when we look at AI and we're talking about tons of biological data because millions of people are being monitored with biosensors inside of their body. All of this data is being collated. So now, combined with a fully digital world where, where everything is centralized in one system, Yuval Harari talks about digital dictatorships. Where does that come from? When you combine all of this, you receive a massive amount of data. So now we put this massive amount of data that is in these massive databases and we feed them into AI models. We run diagnostics on this data. And now we can tell if you are about to commit a crime before you commit it. We identify based on the color of your thoughts, based on certain brain activity, whether you're angry. And if you don't want to be a slave, well, we can very easily identify if you are likely to be a dissident. These types of people, you know, they have a certain faith, they have certain beliefs, they, they paused on this social media post for 2.6 seconds extra. So the AI model says that there is a 97.230192, that's how specific they can get, percent chance that this person will actually be dissident, commit, commit a crime, uh, resist our slavery. And now, when you think about this, the government is inside of your veins. There is no running away. When we talk about a microchip, you may have a subcutaneous microchip. You may be able to pull that out. You may be able to burn it. When we talk about the world of much smaller chips, nano chips or low end micro scale chips that have been, you may have been administered with without even knowing, perhaps because they self assembled or perhaps because they were d d administered to you through an injectable that was supposed to be because of a cough cough thing going on and it was supposed to save your life and you need to be a responsible citizen and blah, blah, blah. That's implanted inside of you. And since the government is inside of your veins, there's no running away. There's no escaping. And so, so let me ask you this, Zach. It sounds very much like a movie that was uh, by Tom Hanks quite a few years ago. And so, you know, these are things are all there planted a long time ago to set us up. So are you saying now that with AI that's used to monitor or uh, will it be more enacted with a touch of a button or is it uh, is it selected or randomized? We're looking at, I believe, totally automated systems that say, okay, you know, if you if you look at the the field which they present this technology as in the automated personalized healthcare feed, where we're going to put these nano machines inside of you so that they can monitor you and it's for your health, so we can detect viruses, infectious diseases faster inside of you. There are there's a lot of research that talks about you know uh, for future pandemics we need to put this technology inside of people so that we can detect the virus faster. We can detect certain biomarkers, quorum sensing, blah, blah, blah. We relay that to a biodigital interface. We relay that then to your phone or a smartwatch or some wearable. And then we're contacting the government or corporation servers and relaying this information. We have, you know, cause we're inside of your body. No, there's no PCR test, you know, shoving up the nose. Now we're inside of you. I, for well, the so, AI part yeah. of that question, I yeah. think people are very obsessed with the the semantics of you know these these buzzwords and the hoo ha around them, but that would not be to negate the the danger and the problems that we could face with this system. But even even forgetting AI even exists, just the fact that the government or certain corporations may be inside of your body, 
even without your knowledge or your consent, I think that is that is very concerning and how this could yeah. relate to a fully automated world, whether a digital dictatorship or more of a communist or socialist a social credit system or just any system that that really ta tamps down on our freedoms digitally, where every aspect of your life is a part of identity and access control management. OK, well. That's a lot of information there, and you can see that that's just opened up a world of conversation. And thank goodness a lot of us on this call didn't get the uh, carrot. Um, so hopefully we're free of that. But Zach has much more to say about if, you know, those of us who are uh, not carroted and, Shedding. Uh, and, Shedding. and it's a very, very about, big topic. You know, how we look after our health and well-being and so that's why we need to we need to spend much more time um at the expo with Zach and find out more about this because he's just given us a little smidge can you you can just hear that right it's just <laughs> yeah. top of the surface I um, hope that oh, wasn't too much I uh, maybe I should have cut down a little bit on <laughs> on what I had but uh yeah I hope that helps in just yeah. just a little bit of a taster in what we may face in the future yeah, we did have a, a wonderful question um, from Michelle in the chat about speaking about the nanotech in, in geoengineering and in 5G. You know, I guess we'll, we'll, we kind of need to leave that for another another night. Um, or maybe we can, at the end of this um, recording, we can come back and, and chat about that in the room. But I do need yep. to move over now to Jeff, and uh, we're going to jump into... The world of taxation. So let me bring you on there, Jeff. And thanks so much, Zach. That was really huge. And Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, I, hope, I hope that was helpful. Absolutely. So, Jeff, thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, you know, we were chatting earlier about, you know, this the tax season and what people are facing these days. Can you just give us a world of it in, in your view, um, what what you're seeing? Okay. Well, I've been an accountant with my own business for 60 years, That's, which is a long time for anyone to have their own business. But somehow or other, I've survived. And obviously, with that, um, doing an, probably an average of about 3,000 uh, different tax returns every year, I, I really have a lot of experience but um, as we all know uh, people that have had a lot of experience not necessarily know it all I don't pretend to know it all by the way but I think I probably know more than most and uh, over the years uh, I've always regarded the tax department as a pretty good department really uh, I've always regarded taxation as a necessary evil None of us really like paying it, let's be honest, but we, we know that our government needs it to survive and run the country. And I've always found the tax department fair, just, reasonable, moral. Uh, I, think I could always talk to them. And uh, I think that overall, in general, they're probably one of the better bureaucratic departments that run Australia. Hmm. So as from the 1st you... of July this year, mm -hmm. I've changed my mind completely. Okay. I have found over the last, what, 10 months that the tax department is immoral. They do illegal things. They're unjust. You can't talk to them about anything. If they make a decision on something, they'll say, if you want to, under, if you want to know more, give me a phone call and ring this person. I ring the tax department. I ask for this person. The person's not there, so I leave a message. I've probably done this about 20 times and never yet has anybody ever rung me back, leaving me up in the air with a particular problem that I had. So you can't talk to them. They they run the department a lot with IR, uh, AI. And, and as we all know, with any computer, garbage in, garbage out. So what they use the AI for ends up giving them false statistics and false results. Uh, incredible. I mean, and, and I will be talking at the um, 
at your expo, Kelly, proving the kind of statements I've just said. I've got probably 50 different examples of incredibly uh, unjust things that have happened through officers of the tax department. Most of them, uh, and I, I'm really, I don't believe I'm a racist, but most of them have got names that are unpronounceable, which tells you something. And they don't really understand, in my view, of the culture of us Australians. And uh, in other words, they're, they're new Australians and, and good luck to them coming here. But somehow or other, they've been brainwashed to uh, not give us the just returns that we've been used to in the past. So uh, tell me then, if you're trying to do your tax uh, yourself and you've done your tax in the past before, uh, how do you think a person's going to go doing their tax these days? Well, as I said, they're using artificial intelligence. <clears throat> now, what that means, if, if when you do your tax return, you tend to claim more than the average person in your particular trade or profession, bang, audit, that's what you're liable to get. Now, the problem is, how do we know what the average person is claiming? How do we know if we've claimed more or less than normal? And uh, and that's the problem. Now, if you do if you do claim more and you get an audit, well, you might say, well, that's all right. I've got all my receipts. I've, I've kept good books here. I'm, I'll be okay. But I have found that when it gets to the audit statement, it's probably 50% of the people cannot prove or substantiate according to the now guidelines of the tax department, which are absolutely draconian, old-fashioned, harsh, unjust rules that people just would nearly find impossible to abide by. For instance, in, if you uh, uh, work from home and you use your telephone, you, you, you must, if they question you, not only provide receipts, but prove that you use it for a certain percentage of time. Now, the, what they want you to do then is to produce um, the past records of your phone bill and you mark off like you might a car logbook, what's personal and what's business. Um, and you, you can do that. But the problem is if you get an audit, they say you must reply in 28 days or we'll help knock the whole lot back. You, you apply to Telstra to get your past bills and they take at least two months. Uh, you can't you can't do it. You can't win. And so, and so what happens, for instance, I had one client who was a, a young first-year apprentice in a trade. Like most first-year apprentice, he spent a lot on tools, three th over three thousand dollars worth. Now the guy, when I got when I got the questionnaire from the tax department, he was on holidays. He'd been in, he was going away for a month. So he when he came back, he supplied us with all the receipts. And when I did his return, I said, This is a fair bit. Have you got receipts for all this? And he was confident that he would. So he brought them all in and we sent them in, but because he brought them in late, we were one day late. Mm. Whole lot knocked back even though we put in an explanation he'd been on holidays. This kind of thing's never happened before. The tax department has always been reasonable in my book, but not any longer. And so we will put in an objection, sure. But then we put in the objection, and then they come back and say, still knock it back, because, or well, they could, we haven't done this yet with this guy, but other examples, they knock it back and say, well, uh, yes, we we believe that he's bought these tools. You've provided the receipts, but did he use them for the business? Prove it that he used it for the business. And so you have to then get a letter from the employer de uh, detailing every one of those tools and saying that in his opinion, it's used for the business. That's okay. In most cases that can happen. But in some cases, the guy might have left the employee or the employee has gone into liquidation and closed up. So, and, and if you don't get that letter, they knock the whole lot back. No questions asked. You see, you see, in normal justice in this country, you are assumed uh, innocent uh, until you're proven guilty. That's not the story of the tax department. You're assumed guilty 
and, and you will have to prove your innocence. And in some cases, even though you are 100% innocent, it's impossible to prove you that you to prove your innocence because they assume you're guilty. Wow, well that's frightening, isn't it? It is, and so I think with all the kind of dreadful things that Zach was talking about, I think the the tax department has finally caught up, and I really do believe they have declared war on the normal, simple salary wage earner. This year, they've left businesses alone, as far as I can see. They threatened also to uh, audit people with investment properties. Now, I have been told that as a sole trader, I do more investment properties than anyone else in the country, but I haven't had one audit from that. But boy, have I, have I been inundated with the poor old salary wage earner. Well, I do think that that there was a succession of that, and we we started last year with the small business owner. They got hit slugged with the digital ID, and yes. that was through the accountants, wasn't it? And then, and now you're, what you're saying is they've moved on from the small business owner, and now they're targeting the average salary wage earner. Yes, and so yeah, there's a there's a. Uh, a a, a process that they're working through. That's uh, right. And, and now uh, they're boasting, Kelly, that they've collected more revenue than they ever have in the past. But I believe that a lot of that revenue they've collected, they'll have to hand back when the, all the objections go through, if you're lucky enough to, to get a fair-minded officer to handle that objection, which you don't always get. No, and what they often tend to do is they um, uh, remove the people who have been in that position for such a long time and bring in, as you said, these new players and they don't know the history. They don't know the the standing and they just, they just do as they're told to do because they're, they're new to the game. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing, saying with all these uh, names that are hard to pronounce is that's why they're doing it is they. But they're not all like that. I mean, obviously there are some fair minded uh, good guys that works for the tax department. They're not all like that, but they tend to no. be more of those than than the good guys at the moment. And not only that, they lie. Now, I, I'll give you an example of that. I had a, a, a guy that once again, like the example I gave, bought a lot of uh, tools and, um, and had receipts. And they looked at that and said, well, we're knocking the whole lot back. And I said, why? This was a telephone conversation. And they said, why would you knock it all back? I've showed you all the receipts. And he said, I have rung the employer and the employer told me that he doesn't use any of it for business. So we're knocking it all back. I wasn't content with that. So I rang the employer. Excuse the expression, but it was bullshit. He never rang the employer. He just lied. He tried to bluff me out of going through an objection. You, you can't believe it. The, thing, the low... The, the, how low they've got. Now, and this is a government department. Public servants, public servants be be, be damned. They're not our servants. They're wow. all little dictators in their own minds. Well, Jeff, I hope when we get to the expo that you might have a glimmer of hope for us with some solutions. Yes. Something that we can... I am <laughs> going to provide solutions to this in my talk. <laughs> And I'm also going to give some hints on, on if you're in business, what, what is the best vehicle to use? Should you use a, a trust? There's more, all different kinds of trust you can use. Or should you use a company or a partnership? Or is it better just to be a simple sole trader? So I'm going to address that problem and those issues as well. Beautiful. Well, we yeah. don't want to give away all your material tonight, no, but no. Uh, for those who can't make it to the expo, we might have to have you on again and get you to share that with us another night, Jeff. Sure. Fantastic. Uh, Michael, lucky last. Thanks for jumping in tonight. And to wrap up this conversation uh, that we're having around the future of uh, health and finances, uh, tell us, wh what are you seeing? What's happening in your world. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. So 
In terms of what I see at the moment, we, we really are going through some very historic developments in the global financial markets. And part of my talk is really is just to build some awareness around what these developments are. And I think having some education and some discernment around you know, what's actually happening right now is critical to protect ourselves and our family uh, because you know, we're almost like in, a, in the Matrix movie where you take the blue pill and you're told what mainstream media is feeding you and you can go on and you can sleep well at night or you can take the red pill and you can actually start preparing for what I think are some inevitable outcomes coming down the road. So, you know, without giving too much away, what some of these developments are that we're seeing at the moment is this de-dollarization trend that's happening, which is essentially a loss of confidence in both the US government and their ability to manage their finances, as well as the US dollar itself. All right. So, so we really are at the end, I believe, of the current fiat monetary system, which really it, it started with the uh, detachment of the US dollar from the gold standard in 1971 by President Richard Nixon. So we really have been in this uh, one giant experiment, this fiat monetary system, which for the first time in history, we've got paper money, which is backed by nothing other than the promise of a government, which we know what that's worth, right? We've seen that, you know, just what's happened through this last few years with this uh, other experiment that Zach was talking about that they cannot be trusted. So, you know, so we're all being, we're all being told that, that interest rates are going to be coming down. This, this has been, I guess, in, in the mainstream news of late. Um, and I don't believe this is true, right? So from what I can see in terms of long-term trends, we are in a new long-term uptrend in interest rates. And the reason why this is happening is because inflation is, is rampant, right? So we're all being told that the central banks of the world the Fed Reserve, the European Central Bank, uh, the Bank of China, they're all, got, they're all on top of the inflation problem. But I don't think anything could be further from the truth. So, you know, why is inflation going up? We're all feeling it. You know, cost of living pressure is going up and governments are lying to us about what the inflation numbers really are. If you have a look at the official data that's being put out by governments, right, they're telling us that inflation is around three and a half, four percent 4%, which is complete rubbish. You only need to look at your own grocery bill, have a look at your insurance costs, have a look at your fuel costs, compare it to 12 months ago, and you're going to get a real number somewhere around at least 10%. So it's double, more than double, or even possibly triple what the government authorities are telling us about these inflation numbers. So, you know, we can see what's happening with geopolitics. You know, we've got wars breaking out around the world. And there's a saying, it's uh, Gerard, Gerard Salenti. He's got a saying which he coined, which is when all else fails, they take you to war. And this is something that's happened all through history. When when governments go broke, they resort to, you know, to a war situation, a war footing. And that's where we are at the moment. So we're seeing what's happening in the Middle East right now with Israel and uh, and Iran. And they're getting into direct conflict for the first time, I think, in, my, in recorded history, right? So all of this is going to see oil prices continue to go up. And oil is the lifeblood of the global economy, right? We all need oil. It, it's, it links into our petrol prices. It feeds into all types of hydrocarbons. So, you know, oil is also a very key input in the official inflation numbers. And as this geopolitical conflict continues to escalate, nobody's talking about peace from what I can see, right? So even in the Russia and Ukraine situation, we just had, I think Congress just approved another $90 billion of funding for that war, it's absolutely tragic what's happening over there. I think 600,000 Ukrainians are now dead. You know, most of their young adult population have completely been decimated. So, and then you've got the prospect of trying China and Taiwan kicking off sometime down the road as well. All of this is raising the prospect of much higher oil prices down the road, which is going to affect our hip pocket. But also to the fact that, you know, the US government is bankrupt. They have enormous amounts of debt, $36.5 trillion officially, $215 trillion of unfunded debt liabilities. They're running a $2 trillion annual deficit. They're spending $2 trillion more every year than what they're bringing in in tax revenue. And they're financing all of this expenditure through basically printing of the US dollar. So, I mean, the point now is that the US government is not even able to sell its own government bonds anymore, right? Because of this 
lack, lack of conf, less of confidence or you know loss of faith in the US government. And we're in a situation which is now called debt monetization, where the central bank is the buyer of last resort. It's only the one that's turning up at the auctions to buy US government bonds. So the point is, is that at these current interest rates, nobody wants to buy US government bonds for the risk they're taking with inflation. And we've got $300 trillion of debt globally around the world. And as these interest rates continue to go higher, obviously, it's going to play out in all sorts of manner on an individual level with individuals who have mortgages, right? You only need to look at the 10-year bond yield. It's broken through a very, very clear long-term downtrend. Irrespective of what the Reserve Bank does, mortgage rates are going to keep going up in this country, I believe, over the next three, five, seven, 10 years, all right? Um, and the Reserve Bank of Australia is an institution that's telling us and trying to give us guidance that interest rates are going to come down. This is the same institution that told us back in 2018 and 19 that interest rates wouldn't be raised for a good four or five years until 2024. They can't be trusted, right? You know, and as Zach was saying, you know, further to what he was going on about with the social credit system, essentially, you know, they want to bring in this central bank digital currency. That is the end game of everything that's happening at the moment. So, um, Essentially, what we're seeing is, and I believe this is going to play out over the next few years, we're going to see a continuation of the bank crisis, the banking crisis that already started last year. You know, we had three or four of the biggest banks in history to fail last year. Mainstream media didn't really give it much attention. It was a massive news event, right? And the reason why these banks are failing is because these long-term interest rates keep going higher. These banks are absolutely up to their eyeballs in government bonds, which had their biggest crash in 2022. Now, government bonds are traditionally a safe place to have your money, right? You would need the government to default on its obligations for you to lose your money in a government bond. We just had the biggest crash in 2022, and you're hearing crickets in the mainstream media. These US banks are absolutely loaded up with US government bond holdings. They've got $640 billion of unrealized losses, but they're also sitting on all these commercial loans, which have gone bad as well. Look what's happening since the whole, co I can't say that word, but since the working from home trend that we've seen, we've seen commercial real estate absolutely collapse, right? In many capital cities around the world because people are still primarily working from home. It's hard to get people back in the office. So the point is, is that I, I think this is a trend that's going to continue. We're going to see more bank crisis. And again, I believe this is by design because in order to implement that central bank digital currency, you need to collapse the existing system in order to be able to introduce that that next monetary reset that's coming. So the good thing is, I mean, this is not all dire. It's not all the feist, the, the sky is falling in and, and you've got to be chicken little here. For those individuals who are positioned in the right areas, I think it's going to be one of the best opportunities in the generation, right? This is the great reset. This is what this is all about. It's also great wealth transfer. What does that mean? It means that all of those assets those traditional assets like stock markets, bond markets, and, and share markets that have benefited from lower interest rates over the last 40 years. We've had 40 years of declining interest rates. And all of those traditional assets have benefited from that lower interest rate environment. We're going to see a reversal of that as these long-term interest rates continue to go higher. So if you are positioned in the right areas, right, it is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make life-changing wealth, I believe, right? And that's what part of my discussion is going to be. It's about, you know, what are the areas that that, that I believe we're going to see massive gains in and a bit more further, you know, clarification as to why that's going to happen. So the whole point is that we're seeing evidence of this great reset, this wealth transfer. It's already transpiring in assets like physical gold. Gold's just broken out through to new all-time highs. Again, you're not hearing about it in the mainstream media, right? Why is that? It's because the central banks themselves, they want to buy as much of it as possible. Because when this fiat monetary system resets, the countries who have the most amount of gold are the ones who are going to be making the rules in this new system, right? And they don't want the popula population to buy it, right? They want to continue to funnel people into their fiat paper monetary system. So, you know, this... This evidence is clear to see. We're seeing it in crypto like Bitcoin, right? It's an alternative asset to the traditional paper-based assets, right? We're seeing it in the price of silver. It's starting to break out quite quickly as well. So 
the point is, is that some of these traditional assets that I mentioned, they are tiny when you compare it to the wealth that's in these traditional assets. So again, if you're in the right areas, there is amazing wealth to be made you know, going forward. And what I'll also be talking about is just some of the you know, traditional financial planning strategies that people can take advantage of with obviously Jeff's structures that he can put in place to be able to take advantage of and get into these right areas, for example, using your superannuation, right? Which down the track, you know, in pension phase can be a very tax effective environment for building wealth. So, you know, we'll get into that in a bit more detail, but the point is, is you want to become your own central bank. You want to take control of your finances and not stick your head in the sand because we saw what happened, to, you know, 13 years ago with the global financial crisis. You know, there was a 50% drop in the stock market. I believe what we're coming into is going to make the central bank, sorry, it's going to make look the global financial crisis look like a walk in the park. We have three asset bubbles converging at the same time. The 2007-2008 global financial crisis was primarily a real estate asset bubble that went bust in the United States. Today, we have real estate, we have the bond markets and the stock markets all in a bubble at the same time, which are not going to be able to handle higher interest rates. So again, it's all about how do you protect yourself? How do you protect your family? How do you take advantage of tax rates, tax effective environments, and making sure that you've got the right portfolio for the environment that we're getting into? So that's that's the crux of what I'm going to be talking about in my presentation. You know, it's um it's a bit out of the lanes of what a traditional financial planner would talk about with their clients, but we're not in normal times, yeah. you know, and you know, the traditional investments that normally work in a declining interest rate environment, unfortunately, those strategies are not going to work going forward either. So you need out of the box thinking, you need to think a bit differently around what you need to do now going forward. Do you see that we're going to get into a, a big gap between the rich and the poor? Do you think that we're going to lose the, this middle class section and we're going to see that big divide? Absolutely. And, and that's been a trend that's going now for quite a while, but I think it's going to only accelerate going forward because unfortunately, those who are not positioned in the right areas, those who have big mortgages, right, who don't have any assets other than, for example, their principal place of residence, right? You think about the central bank digital currency and what it's going to, going to do. It's all about universal basic income. You know, it's about you know, taking interest rates to a point, and I believe, again, this is by design because it's happened in the past where you get you load people up with debt with the promise that their asset prices are going to go up, right? You raise the interest rates and then you see an absolute decimation of a lot of these assets. People are not going to be able to afford the interest rates and the mortgages that they hold. So who benefits from that? It's the elite. It's the global central banking elite. They're going to be able to pick up a lot of these assets at much lower valuations, they have the ability to print currency out of thin air, right? So you're absolutely right. It's going to be more like a feudalistic system, I think, going forward. The middle class is being obliterated out of this system, unfortunately. So it's just about building awareness. How do you prevent being that that victim? How do you get into that right area? And that's what you know my message is about. Do you know what? And as I listen to the three of you talk tonight, I think how do we navigate these next few years? Um, the This is where we are particularly beautifully placed in, I want to call it, you know, the freedom community, is that when we are wise up to what's happening, uh, when we look after our health, we look after our mindset, and we are in the know, we can navigate these areas and we can, I feel like we can come out a little bit ahead, right? And it may not be as scary the next few years as, as people are, are concerned about if you are in the know. Now, what I also believe that it takes us is uh, we all are part of this big uh, cog in the wheels that some people need to be on the forefront of the politics side of things some and making change or, or preventing those, you know, getting out of control. Um, but each of us need to take a personal responsibility for where we're at with our, with our finances, with our health, um, and be, get connected with 
Michael, with Jeff, with Zach, with the experts who can show us what do we really need to know so that we can come out ahead. So uh, we do have some questions in the chat and I don't know if you can see some of those questions, Michael, I'll let you um, respond to those. And then I do have a few questions just to wrap up the evening, um, one for each of you. So uh, before we move on to a different topic, um, gold and silver or CBDCs, do you want to speak to those? Yeah, I mean, are you happy for me to answer a couple of those questions? Yeah, yeah, and just um, we'll, we'll kind of maybe concisely. Okay, so so Michelle, there's a question there. Could it be the fact that 80% of the US dollar in circulation were printed in the last three years? It's a really good observation. So, you know, the amount of money that was created after the experimental um, event that we had, I mean, it dwarfed any, it was, a, it, how can I say, a hyperinflationary type currency circulation or creation event. And that is why we have the inflation we have today is because, you know, there's too much money which has been created and not enough goods being produced to keep up with the rate of money supply. And that is what the very definition of inflation is. It's too much currency being created. We're all told that inflation is right. prices going up. It's not, it's just the effect of that um, that action, right? So what are your suggestions to produce, produce, sorry, protect wealth and assets? I believe we're going into a, a significant commodity bull market, right? So a lot of these assets that are in the paper monetary system are going to be looking to get out. They're going to go into hard assets. So look, traditional assets like gold and silver have always been there. Mm -hmm. And you don't even look at it like it's an investment. You treat gold and silver as a form of savings, right? It's been money for 5,000 years and it's a form of money that cannot default. It cannot bankrupt. There's no counterparty risk, right? Whereas the fiat monetary system we all have in our bank accounts, you know, it can be created out of thin air and, and hyperinflated. And that's why we're going through all of this um, loss of purchasing power with our money at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's another question there, Suzanne, is gold and silver subject to bail-ins or when the financial system collapses? Yeah, if you're holding your gold and silver with a financial institution, a major bank, it absolutely is subject to bail-ins, right? So a bail-in is when a bank basically uses customers' deposits to, you know, to try to save that financial institution. And the laws are in place. We are all unsecured creditors. When you've got a money on deposit with the bank, it's the money is not essential. Legally, it's not yours. You're just providing a loan to a financial institution. And in the worst case scenario where you do have some major banking crisis, the banks do have the ability to withhold your savings from you. And that includes gold and silver in, you know, some kind of a facility or custodian facility with the bank. So if you're going to hold gold and silver, it's always best to, I believe, hold it outside of the banking system. Mm. That's awesome. Uh, so if you want to come to the expo and see these guys speak live, uh, at 2.10, Zach will be speaking in the chapel uh, just on the topics that you've heard tonight. And then right after Zach, you'll hear from Jeff and Michael, both at 2.50. Who's going first? Who's speaking out of the two of you first, Jeff or Michael? Uh, that'll be me, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you're going to lead us out with, with uh, what what the situation looks like and some of those steps that we can take and then we'll turn it over to Jeff for, for the nitty-gritty, how we can uh, take those suggestions on board and, and implement them. Exactly right, yeah. Fantastic. And then um, let me just bring you all on just to, so we can recap. What what if I don't mind, Kelly? We'll also be having a stall there, which will be there the whole time. So where it might be difficult to, if you want to ask some personal questions, and let's face it, when it comes to finance and tax, one one solution doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. So you know, so if you'd like to come along and talk to us individually, we'll both be there at the stall for the whole day, except for when we're presenting in the afternoon. And we'd be very happy to talk to any of you at any time. Magic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and then it, there was a, was there any other questions in the chat that I missed? 
Anyone want to? Sorry, yeah, there was a question. I don't mean to hog the limelight here or anything, but um, I think Zach had a question. So what do you think will happen to the value of gold in the future, particularly with central bank digital currencies? Yeah, so further to what I, I, my personal opinion, Zach, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think, you know, there's a reason why gold is breaking out through to all-time highs is because money is now desperately trying to get out of this this paper-backed system. And again, you look at the central banks, they've just bought up more gold in the last few years than any, any time since the 1950s. They are accumulating wow. it. They are getting ready for a currency crisis. And again, it's those people who have precious metals. They're going to be able to have options outside of a central bank digital currency, right? You're still going to be able to, I believe, trade with others for physical, tangible goods, whether it's land, whether it's beef, whether it's fruit and vegetables, you know, if you've got a form of money that people will accept, you've got options outside of that CDBC system. So that's why I think it's so critical critical right now to to consider that as part of your wealth protection strategy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think I asked that question just because I've heard some people talk about that as a concern where like post implementation of CBDCs, where people don't see like between each other, they don't see the value in gold. They can't do anything with it. Uh, and I, I don't know, you know, if, if that could become a thing, but yeah, that's, that's why I asked the question. Yeah. And that's a good point. Um, and a good reason to ask the question. And if anyone saw our call last uh, week, when we spoke to uh, Murray from Country Meat Directs about about what's going on in the meat industry, um, then it's really important time to get to know your farmer direct and get to your meat coming coming directly from them because at some point they will only just work with their customer current customers instead of bringing new people on. So if you think, oh well, I'll just keep shopping where I'm at until the time comes and then I I'll reach out, it'll it'll be too late. So um, as we wrap up tonight, it's been amazing conversation and very meaty, if I can use that term. Um, I just have one last question for you, Zach. Tell us about, uh, for those that, that may not be aware, the yellow goggles. Ah, the yellow goggles. This is just, uh, you know, blocking blue light. Uh, that That's a whole other topic on it on its own, you know. Uh, but so, yeah, I personally as well, you know, I, uh, I don't really like very strong lights. I have all of this lighting right now so that you can see me, my hand gestures are, you know, all over the place. It's because otherwise, you know, if I, if I just turned on my room light, you would not be able to see me like, like Jeff earlier, it's, I like it very dim and, uh, it's very surprising. You know, you, maybe you can, you can Google Li-Fi or visible light communications. There's some some very dangerous things that they can do with light. If you search optogenetics, some some very dangerous ways that that light computer screens can be can be utilized and weaponized against us. Uh, so this is just a little bit of protection. Beautiful. It's also better for your sleep to be able to block out that blue light before an hour before you go to bed. Yeah. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm, sh I'm sure you can uh, agree that it's been very enlightening and uh, we really have appreciated um, your wealth of knowledge. A um, oh, few puns there. Well, join us to next week. Uh, we will, this is the last Tuesday before our expo and we have an incredible lineup for you next week. Uh, I won't be hosting next week, actually. We will have the incredible Murray from Country Meets Direct. He will actually host the evening, and he's going to be into, into interviewing Dr. Pran Yoganathan, and I'm so jealous um, because he is just uh, the bee's knees when it comes to health, and he's a gastroenterologist who's very aware and awake and, and has some really important information to share with you. Uh, so he will be joined by Candice Coglan, who is our fermentation guru, and also by Cherie Hunt. There's an oil for that. And so 
they, they will all be turning our attention to health um, in from the inside out, looking at the gut and what we eat, and and we're calling it uh, ancient solutions for modern health problems. So we look forward to having you all next Tuesday at the same time, 8 p.m. Sydney time, 6 p.m. WA time. We look forward to seeing you there. And don't forget to get your free ticket to the expo where you can see these guys tell the whole story uh, for free. I couldn't offer you anything better than that. Uh, and so thank you again for giving us your time. Gentlemen. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And thanks, Jeff and Michael. That, those were incredible talks. I, I look forward to, to listening to you guys uh, at the Expo. Thank Excellent. you. Thank, thank you very much. Good. And you too, Zach. Very thank interesting. You. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, who's joined us in the room. We really appreciate your questions and being here. And if you're not already following us on our Telegram channel, um, it's it, look for the My Self Reliance channel or the My Self Reliance chat group. Uh, and there you can chat away and share all your good information. So good night, everyone. Yeah. Welcome to the My Self Reliance Expo. It is a wet, rainy day in April, but we are having the best time. We were just doing the chocolate wheel. Actually, no chocolate prizes, but uh, it's been the world for a dollar. We're prize up to fifty dollars. Fantastic! All oh. benefits going to my self reliance. <laughs> Three. We have taken the best of the speakers that we have on our Kawinda Community Connections every Tuesday night and we brought them all together in this one place where people can experience all the good things that people have been sharing with us about. together because we're all about learning, education, workshops, uh, highlighting people's skills and talents so that we can all learn from each other and cooperate in a way that you know we, we maybe haven't seen before. Um, and certainly people who didn't think that they had skills to share are really shining in this space. So we're going to go from the expo July we'll have a summit, so that'll be 20 speakers over 10 days. And then come spring in October, we're actually gonna do a two day festival. So that will be another opportunity to bring people out to the sunshine and get amongst it and really envelop it all over two days. So we're so thrilled that you can be here and enjoy the fun. Um, and if you missed it, we hope that you come again to the next one. We look forward to seeing you. Thanks so much.